This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something that would forever change Stanley. Something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour, when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Stanley stepped into the broom closet, but there was nothing here, so he turned around and got back on track. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, what dark secret was being held from him. What he could not have known was that the keypad behind the boss's desk guarded the terrible truth that his boss had been keeping from him, and so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number. Two, eight, Four, five. But of course, Stanley couldn't possibly have known this. Yet incredibly, by simply pushing random buttons on the keypad, Stanley happened to input the correct code by sheer luck. Amazing. He stepped into the newly opened passageway. Descending deeper into the building, 
Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold, Stanley thought to himself. Did he have the strength to find out? Now the monitors jumped to life, their true nature revealed. Each bore the number of an employee in the building, Stanley's co-workers. The lives of so many individuals reduced to images on a screen, and Stanley, one of them, eternally monitored in this place where freedom meant nothing. This mind control facility, it was too horrible to believe. It couldn't be true. Had Stanley really been under someone's control all this time? Was this the only reason he was happy with his boring job? That his emotions had been manipulated to accept it blindly? No, he refused to believe it. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! It was unthinkable, wasn't it? Was it even possible? Had he truly spent his entire life utterly blind to the world? But here was the proof, the heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions, happy or sad or content, walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he would dismantle the controls once and for all. And when at last he found the source of the room's power, he knew it was his duty, his obligation, to put an end to this horrible place and to everything it stood for. Blackness and a rising chill of uncertainty. Was it over? Yes! He had won! He had defeated the machine! Unshackled himself from someone else's command. Freedom was mere moments away. And yet, even as the immense door slowly opened, Stanley reflected on how many puzzles still lay unsolved. Where had his co-workers gone? How had he been freed from the machine's grasp? What other mysteries did this strange building hold? But as sunlight streamed into the chamber, he realized none of this mattered to him, for it was not knowledge or even power that he had been seeking, but happiness. Perhaps his goal had not been to understand, but to let go. No longer would anyone tell him where to go, what to do, or how to feel. Whatever life he lives, 
It will be his. And that was all he needed to know. It was, perhaps, the only thing worth knowing. Stanley stepped through the open door. Stanley felt the cool breeze upon his skin, the feeling of liberation, the immense possibility of the new path before him. This was exactly the way, right now, that things were meant to happen. And Stanley was happy. This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened, something that would forever change Stanley something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Truly a room worth admiring. It had really been worth the detour after all, just to spend a few moments here in this immaculate, beautifully constructed room. Stanley simply stood here, drinking it all in. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. Look, Stanley, I think perhaps we've gotten off on the wrong foot here. I'm not your enemy, really, I'm not. I realize that investing in your trust in someone else can be difficult, but the fact is that the story has been about nothing but you all this time. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. Someone you've forgotten about. Please, stop trying to make every decision by yourself. Now, I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for her. This is it, Stanley. Your chance to redeem yourself. 
to put your work aside, to let her back into your life. She's been waiting. That's her, Stanley. You need to be the one to do this, to reach out to her. If you can truly place your faith in another, then pick up the phone. As Stanley picked up the phone, a white light engulfed him, filling him not just with radiance, but with hope. Hope for a life reunited one... Wait, oh goodness. Stanley, did you just unplug the phone? No, that wasn't supposed to be a choice. How did you do that? You actually chose incorrectly? I didn't even know that was possible. Let me double check. No, it's definitely here, clear as day. Stanley picks up the phone. He's taken to his apartment where he finds his wife and the two pledge themselves to one another. Music comes in, fade to white, roll credits. Not picking up the phone is actually somehow an incorrect course of action. How is that even possible? None of these decisions were supposed to mean anything. I don't understand. How on earth are you making meaningful choices? What did you... Wait a second. Did I just see... No, that's not possible. I can't believe it. How had I not noticed it sooner? You're not Stanley. You're a real person. <sighs> I can't believe I was so mistaken. This is why you've been able to make correct and incorrect choices, and to think I've been letting you run around in this game for so long. If you've made any more wrong choices, you might have negated it entirely. It's as though you completely ignored even the most basic safety protocol for real-world decision-making. Or did you not grasp the severity of the situation? Well, I won't have that kind of risk on my watch. I'm going to stop the game for a moment so we can educate you properly on safe decision-making in the real world. Please observe this helpful instructional video. Choice. It's the best part of being a real person. But if used incorrectly, it can also be the most dangerous. For example, in this scenario, a hypothetical real person named Rupert has a choice. He could invent a machine that eliminates food shortages across the world to make life better for all people or he could spend years of hard work forgetting how to read. Which choice would you make? Remember that unlike here, the real world makes sense, and at no time should you make a choice that does not conform to rational logic. If you find yourself speaking with a person who does not make sense, in all likelihood, that person is not real. Allow the person to finish their thought, then provide an excuse why you cannot continue talking. Turn to a partner and practice saying, my goodness, is it 4.30? I'm supposed to be having a back sack and crack. Excellent. Making choices on a regular basis is the best part to a healthy decision-making process. Most medical professionals recommend making at least eight choices per day. Do you make more than eight? Less? And finally, if you begin to wonder if your choices are actually meaningful and whether you'll ever make a significant contribution to the world, just remember that in the vast infiniteness of space, your thoughts and problems are materially insignificant and the feeling should subside. At this time, your instructor will guide you in an exercise to test and reinforce the material covered in this video. Ah, welcome back. You may have noticed that this room has begun to deteriorate as a result of narrative contradiction. But not to worry. Now that you're properly informed on good decision-making, we're going to revisit a choice you made just a few minutes ago and see what the correct thing to do would have been. This way, please. Now that we know your choices are meaningful, we can't have you jumping off the platform and dying. Imagine the main character dying senselessly halfway through the story. That story would make no sense at all. 
We just need to get you home as soon as possible before the narrative contradiction gets any worse. Unfortunately, it seems this place is not well equipped to deal with reality. there, you'll take the door on the left, back to the correct ending, the story will have resolution once again, and you'll be home free in the real world. Remember, all you need to do is behave exactly as Stanley would. That means choosing responsibly and always putting the story first. I'm quite sure you'll be up to the task. Just follow my lead and you'll be fine. All right. <clears throat> when Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping inside his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, until he saw the door with a voice receiver next to it. Surely behind this door lay all the answers to his questions. And beyond all probability, he knew the passcode. He had seen it on his boss's computer just last week. Nightshark 115. Was this the code to open the door? Would it still work? There was only one way to find out. Stanley had been trained never to speak up, but now he would draw from within himself the courage to face the unknown. He drew a sharp breath and then spoke the code. Stanley spoke the code, Night Shark 115. He spoke it into the receiver, right there on the wall. I'm sorry, is there a problem? You didn't mishear me, did you? Please speak the code into the receiver, otherwise we can't get on with the story. This is a crucial step. Okay, fine, you're not gonna do it, but you know what? It's pretty humiliating to bring you this far, only for you to suddenly decide you have better things to do. I asked you for this one single thing, for your respect. The kind of respect Stanley shows for his choices. He knows what it means to take a story seriously. If you didn't want to see what I had to show you, then why did you come here? You had a choice, you know. You could have gone through the door on the right. You could have done whatever the hell you wanted over there. Why did you come this way? Speak. Say something to me. Explain yourself, you coward. You... ...is behave exactly as Stanley would. That means choosing responsibly and always putting the story first. I'm quite sure you'll be up to the task. Just follow my lead and you'll be fine. All right. <clears throat> When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. No! Why did you do that? Quickly, hurry back in the other direction. Perhaps we're not too late. Oh, it's 
ruined. You, I can't believe, after everything we talked about, that you... My story! You've destroyed my work! Why? For what? What did you get out of that? What did you think was so special about seeing the game undone? Left here like so much garbage, it... Well, it's worthless now. And what am I supposed to do? Even if there were a way to continue, would it be worth it? To know that my story is now incorrect? How can I go back to that? I can't erase that knowledge. I'll have to live with it forever. Reliving its impossibility forever. Oh, I couldn't live that way. Is it better to shut the game down entirely? To willingly destroy all of my work? I don't know. What's the answer? What do I do? What do I do? What do I... No, I have to. I have to shut the game down. I have to. I have to. <laughs> thought you were so clever. Now look where we are. My entire game is destroyed. It was the only thing in the world that was mine and you've run it into the ground. What, did you think that would be funny? You just had to see? Didn't I impress upon you how important it was to be like Stanley? He actually knows how to do what I tell him to. He understands that if I say to do something, there's a damn good reason for it. That thought hadn't even occurred to you, had it? That there's a world outside of you you're a child. Oh, my story. If you'd just gone through the door on the left, you would have seen it. There was a whole underground facility. You would have destroyed it and been victorious. It would have been so perfect. I worked so hard on it. I tried so hard to make... When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Stanley? Hello? Are you... Is everything okay? Stanley, please. I... I need you to make a choice. I need you to walk through the door. Are you listening to me? Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Stanley, this is important. The story needs you. It needs you to make a decision. It cannot exist without you. Do you understand me? Whatever choice you make is just fine. They're both correct. You cannot be wrong here. We can work together. I'll accept whatever you do. I simply need you to take that step forward, please. Choose. Do something. Anything. This is more important than you can ever know. I need this. The story needs it. So, you hear me? Are you there? Are you listening to this? Stanley, are you there? Okay. It's okay, I can wait. You need time to decide. Time to make sure your choice is correct. That is the best choice. That's all right. I'll wait for you to decide what's the right thing to do. Take as much time as you need. Thank you.